Well, good morning and welcome to another teaching. It's a Wednesday morning here in Texas and uh, hopefully y'all are just loving on Jesus, just spending time with Jesus. And um, we say it over and over, there is nothing in this life that's uh, more valuable than um, more important um, and just more productive. Nothing that will just bring just more love and joy and peace and meaning in our lives than uh, than intentionally spending time with Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So today we're going to finish up John chapter two. Um, we are going through verses one through 11. Last time we we got through some of verse seven, I think. And so uh, we'll do a short review and then uh, we'll read it and then we will get rolling and finish it up. So, Father, we do thank you for your favor, your mercy and your goodness on our lives. Father, we just we thank you for your love, Father. Father, above all, we thank you for Jesus, our only Lord and Savior and Master and King. Lord Jesus, we just worship you. We thank you and we praise you today. We thank you, Jesus, for living a perfect life for us and dying a perfect death for us, Lord Jesus. We thank you for being punished for us, Lord Jesus. And we we thank you that you are alive and risen, Lord Jesus, and we worship you today. Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us and guide us now as we open the scriptures, the living word of God. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay, so... um. Again, we're in John chapter 2. We're doing verses 1 through 11. It's a very famous story of Jesus turning water into wine. And again, last time we got through some of verse 7. So I'm just going to go ahead and read the whole thing again. Again, we'll do a quick review and then we'll, we'll finish up verses uh, 7 through 11. Okay. John 2 verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory. And his disciples put their faith in him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. As we said last time, when we read a story like this in the Bible, um, we have to guard ourselves just from the, you know, the temptation to just read it like it's an interesting story. Romans 15, 4 says that everything that was written in the past was written to teach us and instruct us. So when we read this story, we really want to examine it closely and break it apart and just learn you know, what principles, you know, there are in here for us today, right? Um, Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So in principle, how God moved here is how he'll move in our lives, right? Obviously, we have our own circumstances. Um, and so the application will be different depending on our lives, but the principles will always be the same. Does that make sense? So, you see that Jesus is invited to a wedding. And last time we talked about the most important guest in your life and in, in my life is Jesus Christ, right? There's no one more important than Jesus in your life right now. Your dad is not important. Your mom is not more important. Your kids are not more important. 
Uh, certainly I'm not. Your pastor's not more important. There is no one in your life more important than Jesus Christ. And he is by far more important than everyone else, okay? Um, Jesus Christ is God, right? He's God the Son, right? We have a triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus, God the Son, that became a human man for you and I, that lived a perfect life on earth for you and I, that died a torturous, torturous death on behalf of you and I, and is alive and risen. And it's only in trusting in Jesus and relying on Jesus as your only Lord and Savior that we have eternal life, that we have our sins forgiven, that we have relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, it says, and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Do you invite Jesus into the details of your life? You want to literally, in prayer, invite Jesus into every aspect and every detail of your life. Again, if you haven't received him as your Lord and Savior, you want to certainly trust in him and invite him into your heart. Ask him to come into your heart and to be the Lord of your life and to save you from your sin, proclaiming your full trust and reliance and confidence in Christ alone. Right. And now if you do that, and obviously if you mean it sincerely, Romans 10, 13 declares that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, right? Now, again, it's not the words that save us. It's Christ that saves us, right? But the words are, you know, are the, the median we use to communicate our trust in reliance and desire for Jesus Christ to be our Lord, right? When we humble ourselves before Jesus and proclaim knowing our desperate need of him, right? And that he's our only hope. And out of that, out of that knowing that we're sinful people, when we cry out to Jesus and, and ask him to be the Lord of our life, and again, we invite him into our, into our heart to live inside of us. And when you do that, Jesus actually comes and lives inside of you by his Holy Spirit. He becomes one with you in spirit. You become married to Jesus. You're called the part of the bride of Christ and the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Um, God the Father becomes your heavenly father. It's, uh, it's the most incredible thing in the world. So that's the beginning of the Christian life, right? But then as Christians, we want to invite Jesus into literally everything we do. Invite him into your work day, right? Just in prayer, say, Lord Jesus, I do invite you into this day. And I ask you to be a part of this day. And I ask you, Lord, to lead me and guide me in my, in my work today. Um, invite him into the blessings in your life, right? The things that are going well. Invite him into your difficulties, right? You just want to make Jesus a part of everything. Does that make sense? And, and really, that's the meaning of life is increasingly making Jesus a part of everything and, and helping others to do so. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right. We see in verse three, it says, when the wine is gone, his mother said to him, they have no more wine. This is a, a very powerful statement by Mary, because where do you go when you have a problem, right? Mary, Mary knows somebody at this wedding who can handle the problem. Where do you go when you have a problem? Most of us, regrettably, even as Christians, um, Jesus is the last place we go. Like when nothing else works, we've tried everything else, then we finally go to Jesus. Um, that's not Mary, right? It's interesting that, that this isn't even Mary's problem, right? This is someone else's problem, but she's going to Jesus on behalf of somewhere, someone else, right? We talked about that in this culture to run out of a wine at a wedding would be just a massive social disgrace. It would be a humiliation that would never be forgotten. So it was a big deal, right? And so Mary goes to Jesus because she knows he can do something about it, right? So you and I, again, want to make a habit today of increasingly going to Jesus, right? When, when we have, you know, issues or difficulties, and not only in our own life, but, you know, in that of others, right? When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him to have no more wine. Now, it's interesting in verse 4, he says, Dear woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. So you can see Jesus kind of, um, you know, he pushes her away, right? He, he rebuffs her, right? He lets her know that, you know, why are you involving me in this? It's not, it's not time 
for me to reveal myself. Now, it's interesting. He doesn't call her mother. Okay. Right, Jose? He calls her dear woman. Now, in this, in this, uh, you know, in their culture, dear woman was a very respectful term. It's not like in our culture where we'd say woman. It's not like it is at all. Okay. So he's being, he's being respectful, but it is noteworthy that he doesn't call her mother anymore. Okay. Um, and that's because his relationship with her has changed, right? Um, he calls her dear woman as he would any woman here, or if he, any other, any man, he might say dear man, right? Um, and again, there's a principle here that when we find in verse five, what his mother says, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Tr try to picture this, right? Because it's, uh, you know, he lets her know in no uncertain terms that this is not something he he's planning on doing, right? He lets her know, as a matter of fact, that my time has not yet come. You see verse four, my time has not yet come. But when you read verse five, it's apparent that Mary Mary's not concerned about his time, right? And it's, it's kind of funny, right? Mary's not worried about his time. Mary needs and desires for this situation to be handled. She knows that Jesus can handle it. And so she, you know, she presses into Jesus, as we said last time, um, you know, she's, she's pressing in, right? Most of us, when Jesus said, my time has not yet come, why are you involving me? We might've lowered our heads, right, man, and just said, okay, Jesus, sorry about that and walked away. Now, if Mary does that, certainly this miracle doesn't happen. These people are not blessed, Okay. But Mary, Mary's not taking no for an answer. Sometimes we're going to need to press into Jesus. Sometimes we're going to need to persist, right, in our prayers and, you know, in, uh, in just coming to Jesus over and over and over. Because the first time we go to him, just like with Mary, we may not get the answer we're looking for. When she went to Jesus, obviously she was hoping what Jesus would say, I'll take care of it, no problem. That's not what he says, right? Sometimes Jesus does not give us the answer we want right away, right, Rick? And so sometimes, right, Scotty, we have to, uh, we have to persist in pressing into Jesus for whatever is going on. It could be on behalf of something in your own life or someone else, but continue to go with him, go to him in prayer, right? Continue to seek him, right? You know, because although the answer may be no today, we can see that Mary's pressing into Jesus is going to move up Jesus's timetable, which is a truly remarkable thing. We've consistently heard in, in our Christians' lives that it's not our time, but God's time. Well, well, Mary moves up God's time here by her persistence. Now, again, it's important to understand it's not because she was his mother that this happened. Okay. Um, obviously, Jesus knew before she even came that he was going to do this. That's an important point, right? So why would he tell her then in what he says in verse four, if he's going to go ahead and do it? Obviously, he's not saying it for himself. He's saying it for Mary's sake and for our sake, right? When he says, dear woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. You know, we can't force Jesus to do anything, right? So Jesus knew that he was going to he was going to answer her request but this is clearly put here to show that if we if we if we press into Jesus if we will continue to persevere there's a very good chance that he will move on our behalf right but if we just say pray one time to Jesus and then things don't happen the way we like and just walk away and say oh well well maybe maybe we don't know what might have come of it if we can, you know, if we persist in our prayers, right? If we press in in our prayers, if we really diligently seek Jesus in our prayers and our praises and, and, and in our worships, right? In our worship, I'm sorry. So when he says, dear woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come again. Um, he's clearly saying that, you know, because he wants to see her persist and press in. And to Mary's credit, it's, it's apparent she doesn't even hear what he says, right? It's kind of crazy, right? Because he tells her, Mary, actually doesn't, he doesn't use her name or call her mom. He says, dear woman, my time has not yet come. 
Look at verse five. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. So again, she's not concerned about anything he just said. She's pressing into Jesus and expecting him to, 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 to move, right? She knows that he can. She knows that he has the power to do something about this. And, and she's not taking no for an answer, basically, okay? And so who do you, where do you go to? Again, where do I go? Jesus Christ is the only one that has the power, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's only in Jesus and through Jesus that the power to change comes, right? Mary certainly knows this. And again, she's continuing to press into Jesus and you're going to see that he moves up his timetable. Now, look what, she, look what she says in verse 5. Do whatever he tells you. It's the greatest advice anyone can give any other person at any time. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Okay? Do whatever Jesus tells you is the greatest advice you could give your children or anyone else in the entire history of the world. For the rest of your life and my life, the greatest advice we could ever receive or give is to do whatever Jesus tells us to do. Thank you, Lord Jesus, right? Verse six, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. So again, we talked about last time, this could be up to 240 pounds, right? At eight pounds a gallon, plus the, uh, you know, whatever the, you know, the, the stone water jar weighs, right? So they're extremely heavy, right? Um, in verse seven, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. I think we talked about last time, we may not have, but I think we talked about how this command doesn't make sense, right? And as a good servant of Jesus, I do believe we talked about this, as servants of Jesus Christ ourselves, you know, it's our job to do what Jesus tells us, even when it doesn't make sense, right? If you think about this, they, they probably have to walk to some well. They probably have to draw a bucket at a time, right? So again, let's say there are three servants, right? So they each got to fill two of these 20 to 30 gallon, you know, stone water jars. And if it's a bucket at a time, they're going to have to make, you know, whatever, 40 to 60 trips, of going to the well, getting a bucket of water, going back to the jar, pouring it in, right? If I was one of the servants, you know, frankly, I might have said, um, you know, Jesus, I don't, I don't know if you exactly heard the lady, but it, she said they have no more wine. They, they have plenty of water. It's, it's wine that they're out of. So, you know, us filling up, you know, 180 gallons of water is, is, is really not going to fix the wine situation. <laughs> you see what I mean? Meaning, let's say this takes two or three hours to do, right? Obviously, you're not going to be able to move this thing once it's filled. They, they probably don't have the, the, the water right there. So again, this is going to be a time-consuming process. We don't know how long it's going to take. Jesus doesn't explain himself, right? Fill the jars with water. Sometimes the Lord just expects us to obey him. And, and almost never does he explain himself to us. Our job is to obey Jesus as his servants. And when we obey him, we want to obey him to the full. Look what it says these servants did, right? You'd have thought, because all he said was fill them. You thought they might have filled them halfway and said, you know what? That's enough. It's going to take another hour and a half to do this another halfway. I mean, that's plenty, right? But it says this, it says, so they filled them to the brim. They not only obeyed Jesus when it didn't make sense, but they filled them to the brim. And as we said last time, Charles Spurgeon made the great point that whatever we do unto Christ, we want to do it to the brim. You want to do it to the full. When you obey Jesus, you want to obey him completely and fully, not just sometimes, not just partially, right? You want complete and full obedience. You want to obey him to the brim. You want to worship him, Chloe, to the brim, right? You want to praise him, Rebecca, to the brim, right? You want to love him to the brim, right, Jason? Um, so they filled them to the brim, right? Let's just, let's just live our lives as servants of Christ, 
doing everything under the brim. It's important to note that if these servants don't do what Jesus asked them to do, if they said, you know what? Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Uh, You know, they don't need water, Lord. They need wine. If they don't obey Jesus when it doesn't make sense, we do not have this miracle. Do y'all see that? And I could ask myself, how many times in my life, Scott, have I missed the hand of the Lord because I would not obey Jesus. How many times may have we missed the work of Jesus in our life, the hand of Jesus in our life, the blessing of Jesus in our life, because because we wouldn't obey when it didn't make sense. Father, I do ask you to forgive us and to cleanse us of unrighteousness, Lord, and help us, Father, Holy Spirit, help us to to obey you, to obey your word, even when it seemingly doesn't make sense to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So they filled him to the brim. Verse eight, and look what he does now. So it takes faith for the servants to obey Jesus when it doesn't make sense, right? I mean, imagine three hours filling these things with water. There's no concept that he's gonna turn this into wine. Why are we even doing this? But Just one step in front of another, and now it's done, right? Excuse me. And now look at this step of faith. Now he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Now this right here is maybe even a bigger step of faith, right? Remember, the master of the banquet is just has to be, you know, and the, the one running all this, right? The one hosting the wedding is, is in an extremely, right, just uh, anxious state right now. Because again, to have no more wine at a wedding is just, it would have been an absolutely horrific social disgrace in every way. And so Jesus tells these guys to go to the master of the banquet, who's got to be in a stressful place beyond reason because he has no more wine. Jesus says, now draw some out. Right now, again, they they still think it's water. Right now, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet again, as a servant of Christ. Now, this is a step of faith. You'd be like, uh, you know, Jesus. I don't even know what are you saying. You want me to draw out some of that water and walk it over to the master of the banquet and say, here, take a sip of this. You know, he's gonna. Do you understand how stressed he is? He's going to he's going to think I'm out of my mind. He's going to he's going to berate me. He's going to he's going to think that I'm just you know, why would I go take him some water? Notice again. Look at Jesus's words here, okay? Mary says do whatever he tells you. The only words we have from Jesus are fill the jars with water. 1 2 3 4 5. They can either obey or not. If they don't obey, The miracle doesn't happen. Then he says, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Not a lot of words. They're not difficult to understand, right? See, when the Lord tells us to do something, right? It's not difficult to understand, but sometimes it takes faith to do it. And if we'll obey in faith, we will see the hand of the Lord move in ways we could have never imagined. As I already said, I, I, you know, I don't know how many times I've missed the blessing of the Lord because I wouldn't obey in faith when it didn't make sense. But in faith, it says they did so. Verse nine, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had, where it, where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the wine knew. Now, this is profound, right? Sometime between when they went to him and told him that the six water jars were filled to the brim, sometime after he said, now draw some out. So it could have been, right, while they were walking, they could have drawn out, right, a cup. And while they were walking with the cup, right, they looked down as they were walking and all of a sudden, it went from water to wine, right? That's Diet Coke. But so again, Jesus said, now draw some out. Um, 
again. So when they went back to the to the six water jars after they had told them they're they're full, they could have went back and it, they could have all been wine then. Or more probably, it happens when they draw out some of the water and by faith, they're walking with it to the banquet. I mean, to the master of the banquet. Can you see how much faith this takes, y'all? I mean, this is this is crazy, right? Imagine you're walking with this cup of water and not knowing, and then all of a sudden again, you look down and wow, now it's wine. But because they were faithful servants, because they obeyed Jesus on multiple times when it didn't make sense. The words Jesus told them were simple. It wasn't complicated. But sometimes we complicate the simple instructions of Jesus Christ, our Lord, right? But because these servants were obedient, right? They, they were allowed to witness and they knew this miracle of Jesus Christ, okay? The master of the banquet did not know. The bridegroom did not know, right? But it says the servants who had draw the water knew what had happened. If you and I will be faithful servants of Jesus Christ today, if we will give ourselves to Jesus Christ, if we will, if we will walk with Jesus, if we'll grow in relationship with Jesus, and if we will obey Jesus, even when it doesn't make sense, we will see the move of Jesus Christ in our lives in ways that we could not have imagined, right? But we have to be obedient servants of Jesus Christ. Do you have a heart of a servant, right? You notice the big cheeses, the bridegroom, the master of the banquet, right? They didn't know, right? It was the lowly servants who knew. Are you willing? Am I willing to be a lowly servant for Jesus? There's no greater place, right? What's the one thing you want Jesus to say to you, right? You remember, you know, remember in the scriptures where, uh, you know, where Jesus said, you know, all we want to hear from Jesus is we want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Isn't that what you want to hear Jesus say today? You'll see that scripture on the bottom. Well done, good and faithful servant. There's nothing I would like to hear more from Jesus than well done, good and faithful servant. And uh, these were faithful servants. And because of that, they got to see the hand of the Lord move. They had never again, nor would they witness a miracle like this, right? And none of us have, right? None of us have seen anything like this. But these faithful servants, because they obeyed the Lord, had this incredible miracle. Now listen, if they weren't faithful servants, if they wouldn't fill the jars with water because we don't need water, we need wine. And if they um and and if and if they didn't have the faith to go to the master of the banquet, right? Because apparently it's still water that I just put in there. If they don't have the faith and the obedience to follow Jesus, right? Then uh then they don't see this miracle, right? And you notice, you notice they, uh, they have to obey Jesus and the blessing comes afterwards, right? Not only if the, if the servants don't do this, not only do we not have this miracle, not, of course we don't have it in our Bible, but the humiliation of, of, the, of the host of that wedding would have, been, would have been horrible for the rest of their lives. But instead, because of their obedience, the servants just bring a massive blessing. And now they have what? Um, 120 to 180 gallons of wine, which again, the leftover could have been sold. The blessing of Jesus was overwhelming. Now, it's interesting. Jesus didn't utilize anything to do it, right? You remember when Moses put the, the staff into the sea? Jesus doesn't, doesn't use anything. He just wills it and it happens, Right? He just thought, and it, the waters changed to wine. So we see a power coming from Jesus here, which is clear. He's full-blown, almighty God, right? With the power of God over, you know, whatever that is, the science of that all, right? To literally change water into wine is a massive scientific difference, right? And he did it in the thought. He simply willed it, and it was. <laughs> yeah, Huh. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. You see that verse 10? 
the master of the banquet goes to the bridegroom and the bridegroom don't even know what's going on. He's probably nervous. He knows the whole situation. Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. And obviously the bridegroom knows that he didn't do anything. He doesn't even know what's going on. But apparently when Jesus changes water to wine, he don't change it to that $4 a bottle wine, right? Jesus changes it to the $400 a bottle wine, right? Jesus didn't change it to cheap wine, right? Jesus changes it to the best. And so you obviously see the principle there that when, when Jesus gets involved, he's always going to bring about what's best. So again, let us give our lives to Jesus today in more substance and in more meaning, right? When Jesus gets involved in something, it's always going to be better. It's always going to be the best, but you have saved the best till now. In what ways can you more intentionally invite Jesus into your life today? In what ways, Gwenda, in what ways, Esther, can you more intentionally invite Jesus in, right? But you have saved the best till now. When Jesus is a part of something, right? It's a good thing Jesus was invited to this wedding, right? And if you'll invite Jesus into your life and into your activities, into your work and into your blessings and into your troubles and all of those of others, others' difficulties and troubles as well, you'll see the, the best can only come about when Jesus is brought into the situation, right? But we have to be, again, we have to be like Mary was. We have to be willing to press into Jesus, even if he doesn't give us the answer we're looking for right away, right? Uh, you know, we first have to invite Jesus into the situation. Then we've got to be willing to press into Jesus, right? Even when it seems like he's, he's saying no or rebuffing us, right? Even when he's saying it's not my time, you want to continue to press into him and say, Lord, have mercy, invite him into the situation and keep praying for his blessing and favor and deliverance, right? Um, and then again, as a, a servant of Jesus Christ, when Jesus asks you to, to fill the jars with water and it doesn't make sense because they got plenty of water, it's wine they're out of, you and I need to be willing to obey Jesus by faith, Right? Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Again, another step of faith by the servants. Father, I do ask you to help us to be better servants of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to serve you more faithfully, Lord Jesus, and in every aspect of our lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And if we'll do this, then we will see the hand of the Lord move. We'll see blessings in our lives, you know, What's the, what's the blessing you're looking for today? What's the, what's the Jesus turning water into wine, right? We all have things in our lives where we want to see the Lord move, right? And Jesus, as sure as he can do this in a thought, he can bring blessing and favor and healing and mercy into your life and into mine. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Verse 11, this, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory. And his disciples put their faith in him. You have faith in Jesus today. Again, faith for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your soul. Are you trusting him in faith as your only Lord and Savior? And do you have faith in him for this life, right, Kristen? For the details of this life and, and all the different aspects of this life. It's always in Jesus and only in Jesus and through Jesus that um, that we have we have any meaning, any hope, any deliverance, any healing, or any heaven. It's only in Jesus Christ that you know that that any meaning in life exists whatsoever. Right. Well, Father, we do thank you for your mercy and your favor and your goodness on our lives. We thank you for the living Word of God. Father, we thank you for this incredible story in John 11, Lord. We just thank you just, uh, Lord Jesus, for your, for revealing your glory, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We ask you to help us, Lord, to serve you in a way 
that, that we could see your glory, Lord. Help us to be faithful servants, Lord Jesus. And uh, we do ask you, Lord Jesus, uh, to bless us and to help us as we, as we labor to love you f- to the brim, Lord, and worship you to the brim and obey you to the brim, Lord, and walk with you to the brim, Lord. Help us to experience your love and mercy and goodness to the brim, to the overflowing, Lord Jesus. Father, we love you, we bless you, and we thank you. Again, we thank you for the word of God, Father. Above all, we thank you for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our only Lord and Savior and Master and King and God. Holy Spirit, we ask you to go ahead of us now. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.